Hi, I'm Mark Green from the Fairbanks Museum, and we continue our discussion on the movements and rhythms of the heavens, talking again about the moon. The last time we talked about the moon and its general motions, including its phases and so forth. But now we're going to get into a little bit more detail over longer periods of time. The moon is actually probably the most complicated object to watch in the skies, mostly because it's relatively near, and as a result, even slight differences in its orbit and so forth can actually make quite a difference in what you see in the sky, and, and it's really part of our challenge here. We are talking about observing what you can go outside and see, and so we'll kind of use that as a background, uh, but one of the things that uh, I think is very helpful is kind of review what we've talked about in terms of the motion of the moon, and then we'll go forward from there. So to do that, we're going to uh, add in a little bit of information here. So we're going to try this so we can see. Oh, I guess I don't need that right in the middle of the screen, but here's what I'd like to show you. And uh, this kind of goes back to what we were looking at last time, looking at the just the basic phases of the moon, but those phases going from a crescent a growing crescent to a first quarter, now a gibbous moon, and then finally the full moon, that is part of the motion of the moon in the sky. Again, just to review that, we're talking about the moon orbiting the Earth. That takes place over a period of approximately a month. There are two ways to sort of calculate that. We can think of the motion of the moon during its actual, you know, circular orbit. So that, in other words, if we start at the new moon over on the right-hand side, the moon will continue orbiting around the Earth, going through its phases, and returning back to the new moon in 29 days and 12 hours. Now, if you were to actually just track a single orbit of the moon around the Earth and not worry about its phases, that's actually a slightly shorter period of time. And the reason that has to do with the fact that the Earth is going around the sun. The phases, of course, are created in part by the sun. You can see here in this image that the moon, depending on where, it's, where it is, our view changes simply because of where the moon is, although the moon is always half illuminated by the sun, just as the Earth is. There's a daytime and a nighttime side. So the idea here in terms of thinking about the motion of the moon, if you were to ignore the idea of the sun, then it only takes 27 days and eight hours to go around. These fussy differences actually show up in a number of ways, including where we see the sun, or where we see the moon rather in the sky during the different times of the month. So again, just to review, a, as the moon goes from its new phase, where it is basically lined up with the sun and it starts to move toward its waxing crescent, as it moves out there, we get this view of the moon with a mainly dark side of the moon, and we still see where the sun is shining on it right on the edge. As the moon continues its orbit, it gradually gives us more and more of a view of its daytime side. And so you can see this is what we call a first quarter moon. As the moon continues to orbit, we get more and more of that sunlit side, so a gibbous moon, and then finally a full moon getting halfway around now the moon is on the opposite side. As the moon continues, we now start to see more and more of its night side. So the moon gets smaller, we call this a waning moon, eventually reaching its last, or, or the thin waning crescent moon uh, before it goes back to new again. So when we think about this and its motion, and we think about the moon's motion through the month, Another way to, to view that is to actually view what's going on in sort of a, a bigger fashion. So we're going to change programs here. And we're now going to look at the same idea using a program called Celestia. Now in this view, you can see the Earth in the center and then this circular line, that is the average orbit of the moon. And I think that's an important distinction and you'll see why this little tiny dot right down here is the moon itself. So if we set this sky into motion, we'll increase uh, the time rate here, you'll start to see the moon moving. There you can see it moving. Now it doesn't move perfectly on that line, uh, in part because the moon's orbit is not a perfect round circle. So this is the average orbit that we're seeing in terms of a line, but now you're seeing the moon in its actual orbit. Now, 
one of the things that of course you're seeing here is just a close-up of the Earth and the moon orbiting it. If we get a slightly more distant view here, and we move out, now you see, of course, the moon is part of this whole system of the solar system with the planets themselves going around the sun. Now, if we were to continue to view farther and farther away, we get to include the other planets as well. Now, as we zoom out farther and farther, the inner planets are so close, you sort of lose their orbits just temporarily. We can, of course, zoom back in. You can see they're there. Now, what I want to do, though, is I want to take a, a look at this larger picture with all of those orbits, and I want to change our view just a little bit. This is important in terms of the moon's motion in the sky. We're going to shift this view so that we can gradually get, uh, there we go. Notice that the orbits are actually very close to being lined up. In fact, if, if we just fuss around with this a little bit, sometimes we can get it to just line up perfectly. But you get the idea that as they orbit, they all orbit about the same level. Now we can move back in toward the inner solar system. And along with that, and we can see the, the motion that they are taking, as we get in closer, and we're going to get in closer, we're going to actually, we're centered on the Earth here. And so as we zoom in toward the Earth, and we'll just kind of put the Earth here in view just for a moment. But as we now go back out just a little bit, that green line that you see, that is the moon. Kind of hard to see it, but that's okay. Because the idea here is that the moon's orbit is also lined up with those same motions of the other planets. So when we see the moon in the sky, we see it in the same location as we see the other planets and in the same location as the moon. So that actually goes back uh, a few lessons ago where we talked about the motion of the sun in the sky and talked about it relative to the stars. So let's let this pause here for just a moment and we're going to take yet another kind of perspective on this. We're going to go back to our program where we're looking at the moon's motion through the course of the month and we're going to think about the Earth's orbit and of course as we mentioned the Earth's orbit is lined up with the rest of the planets and the moon, but the Earth is also tilted on its axis. And this changes our view of the planets and the sun, and as it turns out, the moon, during the course of our orbit through the year. So there are changes to the moon during the year as well. But getting back to the idea of the moon changing during the course of the month, one of the things to think about, since it is in the same zone as the sun, then Here's an image of where the moon would track across the sky. Now, of course, these are actually the paths of the sun, starting here on the lower left, at December 21st, the sun rising in the southeast, not climbing up very high, but then setting in the southwest. Either on the first day of spring or the first day of fall, March 21st or September 21st, the sun rises exactly in the east, gets about halfway up in our skies, and then sets exactly in the west. By the time we head toward the summer solstice, June 20th or 21st, it rises well north of east, climbs very high in the sky, not quite to the zenith, but very high in the sky, and then doesn't set until it's well up into the northwest. This idea, this perspective of the motion of the sun in the sky mimics the motion of the moon in the sky. So we can do this out on a chart or a diagram as you see here but we can also demonstrate that using our program that we know as Stellarian. We've used this program a lot because this really helps to visualize what's going on. So I have picked out an example here. You can see the moon is imaged and so is the planet Venus over in the southwest. But I want you to just note the day, it's a little tiny here, so we'll just certainly tell you, this is December 28th of last year. I picked this date because we have a crescent moon and we also have the sun just setting. So we're now in the winter sky. So we're thinking about the path of the moon in the sky during the course of the month. So we're starting here with a crescent moon. Now, this is the position of the moon. And of course, 
with a crescent moon fairly close to the sun, if we demonstrate, if we move time forward here, you can see the sky gets darker and the moon heads toward the horizon and then quickly sets. So you don't see a lot of that motion. So we're going to back that up a little bit. In fact, we're going to back up hour by hour. And as the sky gets bright and the sun moves into the sky, I want you to once again take note of the moon's position. And we'll highlight it here. It's over in the southeast. It's to the left of the sun. The motion of the moon in the sky when it's a crescent during the month follows very close to the path of the moon during that month. Now, again, this is December. To help illustrate this or give you sort of a chart to, to help out, these lines that I've now placed across the sky are the path of the sun at different times. And so the path of the sun during December, it rises low, remember, in the southeast, doesn't get up very high in the sky in the south, and sets in the southwest. So that would be the path of the crescent moon in December. But as the moon's phase changes, it changes where the moon is located and therefore changes its path in the sky. So we're going to let uh, time progress a little bit here. We're going to go forward by days. You'll see the moon actually disappears out of view for a little bit. But we're going to go forward to the early part of January when the moon is very close to a first quarter moon. We're going to let the sky progress during the day. And if you look to the left, you'll watch for the moon rising. There it is. So I've stopped right here. So here we have the moon coming up into the sky. But notice, instead of rising in the southeast, it is climbing up into the sky in the east. Now, that's very different. And so the path of the moon is going to be very different. In fact, you can see the path of the sun. Again, think of these lines as a guide to the path of the sun in the sky. So that's where it would be. But here is the moon with a very different path now. The moon is about half full, or a first quarter moon. It will let the moon progress across the sky. There you can see it go. And it sets over toward the west. Now we're going to go to a full moon. Now, just re recalling, the moon is full when it is opposite in terms of its position in the sky. And we can actually give a quick review of that. We'll just take a quick look over here and show us this slide. And there we have the image of the Earth in the middle. The sun is off to the right, out of view. And there is the moon on the left-hand side, exactly opposite the sun in the sky. So we go back to our program Stellarium here. And let's just kind of change our image here. There's the moon just reviewing once again. That's the moon when it's about half full. So let's go forward to a full moon. Now, when we do that, we're going to, of course, the moon is orbiting the Earth. And so each night, the moon will be progressing more and more across the sky. And so that's very close to a full moon right there. So we're now going to uh, change time. We're going to go backwards in time. And you'll notice, wow, the moon isn't even in view. I'm going to have to change your view a little bit. Notice where the moon is rising. So we're going to bring it all the way over toward the horizon. And notice the sky is brightened. The full moon being opposite the sun, the full moon will be rising as the sun is setting. Now again, these lines give you a guide as to the path of whatever object is tracking across the sky. And so there's the moon now rising well to the north of east. Now again, just to review, the sun rises over toward the southeast. So a big change in where the moon's position is because of its phase. So during the winter, again, the moon is opposite the sun in the sky. During the winter, winter full moons cross the sky very high across the sky. In fact, we'll just shift the moon a little bit and set it into motion. As we do so, we'll gradually adjust our view so that we're looking toward the south. But notice that the moon is crossing very high in the sky. Now, it may not look very high in the sky here, so we're going to let it get over towards south when the moon's at its highest position in the sky. And we're, we're going to set up a, a different grid across the sky so you can see that. So let's just pause it right here. 
So we're going to change grids. So we had that grid. We're going to add this grid into place. So this grid is just the sky with this center point up near the top part of your screen. That's the absolute center of the sky. So if you're laying down on the ground, that's directly above you. That would place the moon as high as it's going to get in the sky, in the south, in the winter. Now, again, the sun's position at this point is going to be much, much lower. This is the change that we see in terms of picking a particular phase. Now, again, with the full moon opposite the sun, it actually sets up an interesting idea in terms of watching the moon during the year. And this is one of the sort of little viewing projects that you can uh, kind of participate in. As we head into summer, watch for the full moon this summer and watch its track across the sky. Think about another project that we had earlier when we were looking at where the sun was rising in the sky and notice where the moon rises along the horizon and then where the sun rises along the horizon. Those are things you can keep track of through the course of an entire year. So we're gonna add to that chart that we had suggested earlier when we talked about the position of the sun through the year and we're gonna add in the full moon looking for where you see the full moon rising and label that same chart or diagram with the months where you see the moon rising. So there's a kind of a different way of thinking about the moon changing during the month. It changes its path depending on its phase during the month, but it also changes during the course of the seasons. So let's review that a little bit here. We're gonna go back over to our uh, demonstration. We talked about the path of the moon going across the sky and the sun going across the sky. And so we can think of this as the path of the sun. If it is in the winter, the moon is going to be the opposite of that. So in December, when the sun tracks low across the sky, you're going to see the moon track where the summer sun tracks very high across the sky. And just the opposite, again, thinking about the moon as being opposite the sun uh, when, it, when it's full. Then in the summer, when the sun is rising very high in the northeast, nearly at the top of the sky at midday and then dropping into the northwest in the evening, then the moon's track across the sky in the summer will be very low. What do you think about near the equinoxes, near the first day of spring or fall? Well, you know that the moon is opposite the sun. If the sun would be rising in the east and setting in the west, the moon's going to do the same thing, but at the opposite time. So, so the full moon near the equinoxes actually travels along the same path or approximate path as the sun. This also places the moon in the same general locations as we see the sun during the course of the year. We talked about this earlier against the background of stars. We see the sun appear against a background of stars. The moon does the same thing. But of course, the Earth takes an entire year to go around, shifting the sun's position over the course of a year. But the moon goes around the Earth once each month. And that's going to change the moon's position against this background of stars throughout each and every month. And that means if you picked out a particular star, you would see the moon go past that star once each month. But of course, the Earth is changing its position relative to the sun. So you're going to see the moon passing a particular star at different phases. So it's gonna be different times of the night. Maybe it'll even be out during the daytime and you won't see that particular star. But this is what I had indicated earlier. The moon's path across the sky is gonna change in a very complicated way. It changes almost on a daily basis, but it changes during the month and the seasons as well. So thinking about the moon's motion through the seasons, again, we have to involve the Earth and its tilted axis, but we are, are gonna add one more element to that. The moon's orbit itself is tilted a little bit. It isn't exactly the same as the Earth's orbit. It's tilted at about a five degree angle. So that means that the moon's position, since it may be higher or lower than the Earth's orbit around the sun, it's going to shift where we see the moon against that background of stars with a bit of a range of motion. This is an interesting aspect of the moon's motion, something that has been observed for thousands of years. This image you see here with the moon 
as Stonehenge as part of its image. Stonehenge, a stone circle that's found in England. It was built thousands of years ago, and one of its designs, part of its design, was to track the moon moving across the sky. Here's one section of a Stonehenge, which is a little bit more complete. Uh, parts of it have fallen down over thousands of years, but parts of it remain intact, and you can see the moon in the background. One of the things that they found at Stonehenge before they even placed these large stones is they found a series of holes. The stones would be in the center of this circle, and the stones kind of surrounded by this ditch or this large mound and ditch area. But looking out in this direction, this would be the direction where the sun rises on the first day of summer, but it's also the direction the moon rises on near the first day of winter. And they found a series of post holes in through here. Now, these post holes, places where they had tracked where this you know, particular uh, post was, was placed, was lining up with the position of the sun rising, or the moon, excuse me, where the moon was rising because the moon changed its rising point even at its most extreme because the moon's orbit is tilted, sometimes a little higher or a little lower in the sky. Here's an example looking in the same direction. So we use the middle picture as east. You can see the moon would be rising well to the north of east. When is that? That would be during the summer. Or, and you can see how bright the sky is, you can barely see the dotted line of the moon right here. This would be the rising position of the moon during the summer months. So you can see there's quite a change in where the moon rises during the year, but even those extremes, especially the summer or the winter, that also would change because the moon's tilted orbit would shift the position where you would see the moon in the sky. These extremes, turns out there's a cycle of them. And over a period of 19 years, it seems like a long period of time, but over a period of 19 years, the moon will cover all of the possible positions that it would be rising in the east or setting in the west. No, I'm not gonna suggest that as a potential uh, observing project, but it is something that the observers back at the time that Stonehenge was built, they were observing this. And one of the effects of this is it actually gives us a clue about another sort of motion that the moon is involved in. Now, these uh, observations that go back thousands of years, they were tracked in many locations, not just at Stonehenge. These are some stones that are found in the northern islands of Scotland, an island called Orkney. The Orkney Islands had a number of these different standing stones they were all lined up to give us a position of where the moon was rising at different times during that 19 year cycle. So there's the orbit of the moon again, and it's tilt. But one of these, uh, one of the ideas is depending on the tilt of the Earth's axis and the moon's tilted orbit, it can change the shadow created by either the Earth or the moon. If you'll notice in this diagram, this blue square is actually there to indicate the moon's orbit, which is tilted again at about five degrees. Now, because it's tilted, it may place the new moon above or below the Earth, depending on the time of year as it goes through, as the Earth goes through its orbit. So what does that mean in our sky? Well, that means that a lot of times you can see over here, the new moon, and its shadow would be below the Earth, or the Earth's shadow would be well below the full moon. But there are times as the moon and the Earth orbit around the sun where the new moon's shadow would actually be lined up with the Earth, or the moon would go through the Earth's shadow. These are known as eclipses and has to do with the tilted axis of the Earth. So here's just a closer view so you can see quite easily how the shadow of the new moon would be below the Earth. There would be no eclipse in that case. Or the moon would be above the Earth's shadow. Again, no eclipse at that time. But here, things are lined up. And you can see 
the new moon's shadow would strike a part of the earth, but it's also a very narrow shadow. And so it would actually only cover a very tiny portion of the earth. This is known as a solar eclipse, when the moon's moon is actually blocking the light of the sun, and it's a pretty rare event, if you think about it. We haven't seen the solar eclipse here in many years. We did see a partial eclipse a few summers ago. There will be a total eclipse of the sun coming up in April of 2024, so in four years from now. Meanwhile, the moon on the other side of the Earth, when it's a full moon, and only when it's a full moon, the moon can pass right through the Earth's shadow. We know this as a lunar eclipse. In fact, this is what a lunar eclipse would look like. And you can actually get an idea. This is a series of images of the moon. You can kind of see the circular pattern of the Earth's shadow here. Of course, one of the very interesting and curious things that happens during a lunar eclipse is the moon actually turns kind of a reddish hue during total eclipse. That's because if you were on the moon looking back at the Earth, the Earth, of course, would be covering up the sun, but all around the edge of the Earth, you would see sunset. We see this anytime we see a colorful sunset, a red glow on the horizon. Well, imagine that red glow all the way around the Earth, and it is bright enough to illuminate the moon, and that's why the moon can appear sort of a reddish coppery color during a total eclipse. When the moon covers up the sun and we have a solar eclipse, you can see in this image how the moon gradually moves in front of the sun. You see less and less of the sun until it's completely eclipsed. Now, just a word of caution, you don't look at the sun during a lunar eclipse, even though the moon is covering up the sun, when it's even at its very slenderest, that sun portion is just as bright as the entire sun. And by opening your eyes and staring at it, it actually can create damage to the back of your eye. So never look at an eclipsed or even partially eclipsed sun. And here's another image, a series of images showing the moon going in front of the sun, the sun completely eclipsed, and then going back the other way. Here's a partial eclipse of the sun, uh, and this is very similar to what took place back in the year 2017 uh, that we could see uh, from our location. And then finally, there is one other type of eclipse. One of the other fussy things about the moon's motion around the Earth, it isn't perfectly circular. It actually ranges from getting a little closer or a little farther from the Earth. If the eclipse takes place when the moon is at its most distant point from the Earth, the moon, of course, is a little smaller, and it doesn't completely cover up the sun's disk. So we get what's called an annular eclipse. Not annual, which means yearly, but annular, which means circular. And, of course, you can see the circular you know, view here of the sun, this ring. And, in fact, that's often what it's called, a ring of fire. Here's an example of a solar eclipse that was seen. Uh, in northern Vermont, a solar eclipse of the, uh, or, yeah, it's a, to a total solar eclipse, but what we know is an annual, annular eclipse where you could see the entire ring of the sun around the moon. We're going to add one more thing to the moon's motion. We've talked about the moon and what we can see, but this is something that you can also observe, but it's a very different uh, sort of idea. The moon's gravity is strong enough that it actually creates tides on the Earth. Now, it's not quite as simple as that. It's not just the moon pulling on the water of the Earth, on the oceans. So let's think about that. First of all, the moon does have enough gravity. It is strong enough that as the Earth and the moon go around the sun, the Earth actually goes around a common point between the Earth and the moon. That we call this a Berry Center, this is a, a fancy word, which basically means that the center of gravity between the Earth and the Moon is not perfectly uh, centered on the Earth. It's actually slightly toward the Moon. And so it actually shifts the Earth. You can see the Earth is a little bit above the line here and below the line here. That is important because it shifts where the Earth is relative to uh, the 
sort of the, the force of gravity of the moon. And what that means is the water is actually distributed in two ways. The moon's gravity does pull a bulge of water toward the Earth, but because it shifts the Earth toward the moon, there's another bulge of water on the other side. So there are two bulges of water on either side of the Earth. This is noted anytime, uh, if you spend any time near the ocean, there are actually two high tides each month. And that's why, or two high tides each day, because of the two bulges of water. This does one other thing. The bulge of water is actually shifted slightly forward because of the Earth spinning. So two things happen. Because the Earth is spinning into this water, it slows the Earth down. It doesn't slow it down much. It's a matter of microseconds over centuries, but it does change the Earth's orbital or rotational speed. The Earth is slowly uh, slowing down, and that means the days are getting very, very uh, tiny, tiny amount longer over a long period of time. But because it changes the position of where that bulge of water is, this bulge of water does have a little bit of gravity. It does attract the moon, and it actually pulls the moon forward. The moon is getting a little bit faster. And because the moon is moving faster, it's slowly shifting away from the Earth. How much? It actually is moving away from the Earth about 12 inches per year. That doesn't sound like, or it sounds like a, a lot, but of course the moon is uh, a long, long way, 250,000 miles from the Earth. So one foot isn't going to make a difference over your lifetime. But in hundreds of thousands of years from now, the moon will actually be far enough away that there will never be another total solar eclipse. Well, these are just a range of some of the moon's motions uh, around the, the sky. We're now going to finish up for today, but you can continue to watch the moon in the sky. Again, it is one of the most changeable objects in the sky, and so hopefully you'll get a chance to see the moon over a course of months and the seasons and keep track of it. Hope you've enjoyed these segments of the movements and rhythms of the heavens and be on the lookout for some more programming. We're gonna feature some planetarium programming through the upcoming summer. Thanks again.